somebody may be crying tonight.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For God has shown me what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Good morning. We welcome you this morning to the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel here on the yard on the tent on the campus of Howard University. And we pray God's blessings upon you as we seek to worship our God truly in spirit and in truth. We're going to ask Ms. Cynthia Railer to come at this time who will guide us through our worship experience. Good morning, Chapel family. Thank you for worshiping with us today, even on this chilly morning. Thank you to Chelsea Cooper for opening our service with the traditional ringing of the bell. Chelsea is a sophomore biology major, Arabic and chemistry minor from Chicago, Illinois. I'll now ask, now ask Lillian Ulysses, Howard University Chapel Assistant, to come and light our uni unity candle. Thank you, Lillian. Now, after the reading of our scripture, we will have a selection from the Andrew Rankin Memorial Chapel Choir under the directorship of Dr. Eric Poole. Please welcome Christopher Bonner, our graduate assistant in the office of the Dean of the Chapel. Morning, Chapel family. This week's scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28. It reads, For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as a high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once, and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of men, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. God is our refuge and strength, our very presence helping. 
Amen. We are always, always blessed by this phenomenal choir. Let's just give them another round of, a hand, of applause. I want to thank the Crampton Auditorium staff as well as WHUT for all of their support in our weekly services. I also want to point out the Spotlight Network, which you will see as the students um, who are behind the camera right now who make this possible. If we can just give them a round of applause for their work. Please, if you would like to support the chapel, you can do so in a multitude of ways. Financially, you can support the chapel by going to our online portal using the QR code in your program, or you can visit the online portal by going to giving.howard.edu slash Rankin Chapel. I want to point out our speaker's assistant for today. It's Miss Monica Moore. Monica is a sophomore health science major and chemistry minor from Fort Pierce, Florida. You can come back to the chapel all week long for our programs and our events. Um, of course, Wednesday we have a wellness moment with Dean at 12.15 p.m., just 30 minutes. We hope to see you all out there. Now we want to welcome Ms. Chantel Williams who is our Howard University Chapel Assistant President. She will give us this morning's greetings and call our calls to chapel. Good morning, chapel family. My name is Chantel Williams, and I serve as the President of Chapel Assistant. Special thanks to Jessica Turnage and Mia Richardson for hosting last week's Poet Day meeting. This week, please join us for our annual CA lock-in starting at 7 p.m. in Carnegie. We will play Among Us, have a scavenger hunt, and of course, everyone's favorite, the CA pageant. Please fill out the Google form in the CA bio to attend. Food will be provided. If you'd like to learn more about the chapel assistance and the events that we host, please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at CA underscore underscore Howard U. Please. <laughs> Will all the chapel assistants please stand? Thank you. We will be in the back of the tent following service to answer any questions about chapel assistance. Today we have calls to chapel from the Angel Tree Project and 10 for 10's Black Men BBC. Please come at this time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Courtney Charles, and I am one of the community service co-chairs for Chapel Assistance. Um, so the, as you all know, the Howard University Angel Tree Project is currently underway. Um, now we are asking our students, staff, and faculty, and community members to donate general unwrapped gifts for elementary and middle school students. These gifts include stuffed animals, dolls, action figures, puzzles, gift cards, or whatever else you can donate. There's no need to sign up anymore. Gifts are due Friday, November 19th, and will be accepted before and after Sunday service, or Monday through Friday between 9 through 5 um, at the Carnegie Building in Conference Room B. For more information, please visit the Angel Tree table after service or email caangeltreeproject at gmail.com. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Doman, a senior political science and African American studies double major from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alafia Bailey, and I'm a junior Africana studies major, minor in psychology from Houston, Texas. So, 
Tampa Tens, uh second annual Black Men Feed DC event uh, will be held on uh, November 13th, 10 a.m. in uh, Tall Drew Hall. Uh, Tampa Tens Legacy was founded on four pillars, mentorship, community, education, advocacy, and wellness. Uh, our founder, Peter Lumenbella, founded this organization to unite black men throughout the D.C. area and Howard University to support the hardworking families in the DMV. Uh, this year, we will, we will continue that legacy by feeding 2,000 sandwiches to families and homeless people across the D.C. area and taking donations of warm winter clothes and canned goods to support families as well. The importance of uh, black men in D.C. Specifically, it's first to unite all black men across uh, Howard University and also the D.C. community, and specifically uh, to create a safe space on Howard's campus for black men. I know that you know the ratio for black for men and women is kind of off, you know what I'm saying? So we, we are trying to uh, create a safe space for black men, and it's specifically uh, to invite young black boys from the D.C. area to uh, come and be a part of this event to serve as well, and also be around educated black men so they can know it's cool to be black and smart as a young black male, and then also to feed the people and serve the people in the D.C. community. Uh, specifically 10 for 10 is also just trying to bridge the gap between the DC community and the Howard community, sp specifically to break the elitist mindset of Howard is better than the DC community, but we are all one. And uh, also just to uh, be a resource to the DC community as well. So please join us um, next Saturday, all black men in the Howard University and the DC community as well. Uh, next Saturday on November 13th at 10 a.m. in Drew Hall. Next Saturday at 10 a.m. Drew Hall, we'll be making 2,000 sandwiches and feeding the people and making hygiene bags. And also, we'll be having a conversation around manhood, mental health, and education. Uh, but if you want more information, follow our Instagram at 10 for 10 underscore. So 104, I mean, 10 F O R 10 underscore. And meet us next Saturday for Black Men Feed DC. I'd like to thank all of the student organizations who have had a call the chapel this morning. We commend you for your commitment to service. I'd like for us our heads just for a moment in recognition and acknowledgement of the eight people who died and dozens who were injured in Astro World Music Festival in Houston, Texas. Just take a moment. Remember those lost and families. Thank you. Also like to ask to pause once again for remembering our trustee true friend of the chapel, Colin Powell, General Powell, who's been alive this week. He's meant so much to this university, to us. What a great loss. Let us bow here so for me. Thank you. Let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for prayer. I think I've shared with you that in the Hebrew language, it's almost impossible to pronounce the name of God. And the closest thing that we can have in terms of hearing the name of God is our own breath. So I'm going to ask you to, to be still, to close your eyes, to inhale, then to exhale, to notice your breathing, hear your breath, because indeed you are calling the name of God. And as you call the name of God with your breathing, hear God saying to you, be still and know 
that I am God. Hear God saying, I am your refuge. I am your strength. A present help. A present help. In time of trouble. Let us pray. before any human hands touched us. You already knew us. You're closer to us than even our own thoughts. And so we, we come to you, O oh God. For in you we, we find our peace. In you we we find our healing. In you we, we come to know ourselves, our true selves. And because you are a healer more than you are a judge, we also come confessing. Confessing that we have been too anxious about too many things. A single rejection or a disappointment can make us question our worth and make us feel insecure. Help us, Lord. What is it about us, oh God? What is it about us that with all that you have brought us through, why do we allow a disappointment, a failure, a weakness to cause us to give up on ourselves? Cause us to, to lose our joy and to surrender our hope? Come now, O oh God. Come and quiet our souls and and calm our restlessness. In this, in this very moment, make us to remember that, that you have not given to us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Cause us now, O oh God, Cause us to, to feel your power, to feel your love, and to trust you again so that we can trust ourselves again. And in those moments, oh God, when we, we can't figure things out, when no one understands, when we, when we feel alone, when we're ashamed of what we have done or have not done, when we're too hard on ourselves, Leave us not to our own thoughts, our self-condemning thoughts, our negative thoughts, and help us to just trust your love, a love that, a love that sees the good in us, the hope in us, the future for us, and the blessings that you have for us. Help us to, to trust your love enough to be patient with ourselves and others while you're still working things out for our good. Trust your love enough, oh God. Trust your love enough to believe that it's going to be all right even when it feels so wrong. And Lord, help us to, help us to trust your love enough to 
to give ourselves to something greater than our own needs and our own desires. Help us to trust your love enough to, to fight for all who are crying out for justice and for sustenance. Come now, Lord. Come now even to our university. Lift us up to where we belong. Fix what is broken and heal as only you can heal. Come now to your, to your people everywhere. We who are fighting against this devastating pandemic. We whose grief is, is so heavy we cannot bear our own memories. We who are, who are battling various diseases, come to us, Lord. Come to us who, who have no place to call home. We who sit in prisons, we who are poor, we who know the pain of loneliness. We whose souls are being taken over by anger and resentment. Come and heal us, Lord. Come and comfort us. Come and set us free. We're not going to try to tell you how to fix these things this morning. We're just going to let go now. We're going to let go. And we're going to trust you. We're just going to trust you. Now, Doc, I still do the quiet. Until all our striving cease. Take from our Lord, take from our souls, Lord, the stain and the stress. And let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We are indeed blessed this morning to have as our preacher Bishop Donald Hilliard, Jr., Senior Pastor of Cathedral International, Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Wherever I go and I share with people where I was born, where I'm from, and I say Perth Amboy, New Jersey, before they used to look at me strange. But now when I say Perth Amboy, New Jersey, they say, oh, you mean where Bishop Hilliard and the cathedral is located? I said, yes. So I want to thank you, Bishop Hilliard, for um, making my town known throughout the nation. Bishop Hilliard serves as a senior pastor of Cathedral International. He is what I consider, what others used to use the name Renaissance man. He is proficient in so many areas. Uh, he is an author. He is a painter. He is a, uh, a teacher, instructor. He, is, he has it all. And the thing I, I think that stands out in my mind when I think of Bishop Hilliard, though, he is first and foremost a pastor and a lover of God's people. And with all of his accomplishments, and he has done so much the books he has written and so much, but yet he remains faithful to his ministry. He has the heart of a pastor. We are blessed to bring back, and he hasn't been with us for a while, but we are blessed to have him back with us, and I'm sure that you will be blessed by his ministry. Following the selection from the chapel choir under the direction of Dr. Eric Poole, we will experience the preaching the spirit and the ministry of Bishop Donald Hilliard. Pray for him as he comes to bring us a word from the Lord.
I want you to help me celebrate this amazing choir. You know, it's, it's one thing to know how to sing inside with heat. It's another thing to rock the house and know how to sing in the ice. And y'all sang today. I know you're cold, but we can't tell. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice in it, and we are absolutely, thank you, dear, so glad. And it is a privilege and an honor for me to be back at the Rankin Chapel. This is, a, for me, historically, for many, many years, without fail, every year we would make our pilgrimage down to the Howard University Rankin Chapel, and we would sit, and we would have service, and we go and shake the hands of the people and then they would carry us over to one of these halls and we would eat and they would give gifts. I still got this uh, warm up the hoodies, the sweatshirts without fail. And so I was absolutely honored when Dean Richardson invited me to come and to share today. And he said, we're outside, we're under a tent. I said, how are you all under a tent in this cold? He go, we got heat, but we under the tent, but I don't feel no heat. But but I'm glad to be here. I want you to help me celebrate the amazing leadership of the Reverend Dr. Bernard Richardson, our Dean of Chapel. I mean the amazing ministry that he has offered almost 30 years. He has been a world changer and a game changer for this school. He's uplifted us, encouraged us, inspired us, empowered us, help us to understand our callings and our giftings, and we honor him today. Thank you, most sincerely, thank you. And you represent Perth Amboy well, and God bless you, it's a privilege to be here. I wanna also give God thanks for my chapel assistant today, uh, Sister Monica Moore. I want you to help me celebrate her. And for the other chapel assistants uh, that I'm here, uh, program, program coordinators, um, the Andrew Rankin Memorial Choir and all of the chapel uh, assistants and program coordinators, would you please stand again so we can acknowledge you. We are grateful, we appreciate what you do and you represent whatever area that you are in. I met some leaders and, and you know you, you, you sound like you're going to have an amazing church. If they, if they choose somebody based on how they talk, it's you. And, uh, and God bless, and when I, when I pulled up today, um, or when I was pulled up today in the car, it was a blessing to be welcomed right there on the steps, all of these wonderful students, and we give God praise and thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, somewhere, now, Glenn Richardson, you must be online. Glenn's not here, right? Okay, because his brother just texted me and said I was rocking this hat. And uh, I do want you to know that I'm, I'm trained better. I'm from the old school, so I'm trained you don't wear hats uh, in church, uh, but yesterday I had a leadership meeting in our church and I had on a hat because it was freezing there. So please excuse me to have this hat on because I'm just a little cold. I'm grateful to have with us today also two of my sons in ministry, um, Randall Keith Benjamin, who just uh, got appointed for a position with uh, President Biden and stand up Randall, and uh, my other son, Justin Wright, is here, a teacher in the Maryland area. Both of them were raised up in my church. I christened both of them, and uh, we give God thanks for them. My grandson is with me today. Stand up, Joseph Donald Thomas. Stand up, baby. So glad to have him with us. Yes. And um, man, I tell you, time has a way. I remember coming here when his mother was that age. And uh, we give God thanks and praise for life. His parents are on their way down the road trying to get here. Now, I want to draw your attention to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. I know it's cold. I know it's cold. Uh, you saw me working on this iPad because what I was doing was adjusting, um, as Sister Maxine Waters would say, reclaiming my time. Um, I was adjusting my message today because I'm mindful of, uh, uh, of the temperature. But, you know, there are people that are not alive to feel this cold. And so we want to give God praise for every season. We want to thank him for the heat. We want to thank him for the chill. And we want to thank him for observing the changes of the seasons. 
These are things we take so often for granted, but let us give God praise for whatever situation we find ourselves in, we've learned to be content. Our text today comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, and beginning with the 16th verse. And so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I'd like you to journey with me for the next few moments from the subject, his message, our mission. His message, our mission. The last 19 months have been filled with sickness and death, hunger, injustices, disappointment, and depression. Historians are sure to mark this as one of the most catastrophic, fear-filled, anxious, violent, and socially unjust seasons of modern time. Most of the last 19 months, we have been locked in, masked, socially distanced, disconnected, discouraged and in more than a few cases absolutely depressed. We are still trying to navigate through the COVID pandemic, the social injustice pandemic, and yes, even in these United States of America, a food pandemic, there are millions that still do not have their daily bread. And on top of all of that, we have learned all kinds of new ways to be connected online, and we are at a place of absolute virtual exhaustion. We give God praise for you that are supporting the chapel by your attendance online today. We welcome you, and technology is a good thing. That's my good friend Glenn, your brothers online, and others are worshiping the Lord. But, but if the truth be told, we would much rather be in person. But we've had to adjust and adjust ourselves, and our psychology has had to adjust to a virtual existence, and so many are virtually exhausted. As we move from day to day, from one virtual platform to another, from Zoom to StreamYard to YouTube to Facebook Live to Instagram Live, it is absolutely exhausting. And we need the presence of the living Christ, particularly in times like these. We thank God because even in the midst of all of this, we are moving forward by faith. In spite of the issues that are trying to hold us back, our confession is that Jesus Christ is still alive and well, and God is still able. His message is our message, mission. Our text this morning sees Jesus, the light of the world, on the other side of his 40-day temptation and his attack by the devil. He has endured 40 days of temptation, fasting, and prayer, in the wilderness. He has endured the temptation of the master tempter, Satan. He has overcome the powers of evil, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he rebukes the devil. And now it is time for his public ministry to begin. Let me just say, as a side note, there can be no public glory. There can be no anointing without some degree of pain in the wilderness. We find earlier in the text, Jesus is baptized in chapter 3, and the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove. And we hear the Master speak from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And after that, he was led into the wilderness. Whatever your calling is, whether you're called to be a chemist or a scientist or a doctor or a preacher or an attorney, whatever your calling, whatever your mantle is, you will have to endure some kind of wilderness. And Jesus has endured the wilderness. And the scripture says in Luke 4 and 14 
and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And now his public ministry begins. Jesus has returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and report of him went out through all the region. This is the same temple that Jesus was raised up in. We would call it his home church. For 30 years, he was presented in that temple early in his life. And for 30 years, he worshiped in that temple. This was his home church. And we see the beginning now in these scriptures, the beginning of his public ministry. After he endures the temptations of the wilderness, fights off the voice of Satan, he now begins to move forward in life anointed by God to do what the Lord called him to do. He's standing in the temple, and he is handed the book of the prophet Isaiah to read. In the temple at this time, there were several readers. Their Sabbath service would include seven different readers. One was a priest, one was a Levite, and then there were five that were Israelites. Jesus read, and then after he read from the book of Isaiah, this very scripture, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The scripture says after he read this, he handed them the book. Now there's a whole lot more that goes on. After his public ministry, there are people that didn't understand when he said today in your hearing and in your seeing, the scripture has been fulfilled. I am the one who has been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor and to set at liberty those who were bound. This is in essence, beloved brothers and sisters, in essence, this is the gospel message. And his message is our mission. His message is our ministry. And as I look at this text, I see a contemporary application to this very, very familiar text, that Jesus, the Christ of God, is called now to be an agent of loving and lifting and liberation. 38 years ago, Dean, when I came to your town to pastor the Second Baptist Church, a wonderful little small Baptist church of 125 members, I came in the month of October and I was installed, actually this Sunday, 38 years ago, I was installed as the pastor of this 79-year-old church. And beloved, the Lord has been good to me. I've watched God do some amazing things. But when I came to this church, minister, when I came to the church, I didn't come trying to shift an agenda right away. I didn't try to come to change everything all overnight. The Holy Spirit gave me a threefold mandate. Hillier, love them, lift them, and liberate them. That was my mandate then, and that is still our mission statement now. 38 years ago, we are called to love, we are called to lift, and we are called to liberate. In the name of Jesus. There's a whole lot of folk doing a lot of good things. The NAACP is doing a lot of good things. Alpha Phi Alpha is doing a lot of good things. The Deltas are doing a lot of good things. The Boule are doing a lot of good things, but, and that's wonderful, and you should be involved, but, but the church does what the church does in the name of Jesus. You're here today wrapped up in as many pieces of clothing as you can, singing, because you're singing in the name of Jesus. You're directing today in the name of Jesus. You're playing today in the name of Jesus, and we who are Christian serve the Lord in the name of Jesus. We are called to be a people who love, who lift, and who liberate. We are called to be a people who love, a people where everybody is somebody, where everybody feels the embrace and the love of Christ. In the words of my late mentor, the Reverend Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, he taught us that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. No one is that low, no one is that uh, 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 empty or that lost or that, no one, there is nowhere that God's grace 
cannot reach us. And whatever your orientation is, you are loved by an all-loving God. Whatever your problem is, we are loved by an all-loving God, regardless to our color, regardless to our height, how we look, regardless, God loves us unconditionally. Somebody holler yes right here. No one is beyond salvation. I listen, I love to hear Dean pray. I, I listen, uh, you know, I listen to him. And he talked about some stuff. And how many of us are wrestling with shame because we did not have a mother or a father's love? That unconditional love, regardless to how big we are, how overweight we are, how underweight we are, God's love is unconditional. And as a pastor, I suggest that that is one of the main issues in church the church is called to love people one sunday years ago in the summer uh they came to my office and they mean they were running god bless the ushers they came in one of them came and they came running said hey, uh uh bishop we, we, we don't know what to do i'm like what's going on what's going on said, well there's a there's a man that came to church today he's a white man and and he's got long stringy hair and he, he, he doesn't smell like cologne, doesn't smell like perfume, anything like that. He's got long, stringy hair, and he's wearing shorts and a T-shirt. We don't know what to do, and we don't know where to put him. What should we do? I said, wherever there's a seat, sit the man down. You see, this is the Lord's church. This is not my church, and it's not your church. And sadly, so many of our churches, instead of being the beloved community we have become country club exclusivism and only those kind of people belong in our church but all people belong in the church of god and i don't have a right and you don't have a right to determine who can come and sit and even serve in the house of god number two we are not only called to love people we got to love them i could go for a while but we got to love them got to love folk beyond church hurt. How many folk have just fallen out of the church? There's a book called The Rise of the Nuns about how many people just don't have church affiliation in this hour. Then there's another book called The Rise of the Nuns. How many people have been in the church, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and have left the church because of church hurt? Because somebody was mean and someone was unfriendly and someone was unkind. We must love people beyond their pain and beyond their trauma and beyond their hurt, beyond whatever pastor so-and-so did at the other church or usher so-and-so did at the other church. We're called to love. And then number two, we are called to lift people. We are called to lift them from where they are to where God wants them to be. There was a song years ago that we used to sing, Lord, lift us up where we belong, where the eagles fly on the mountain high, Jesus is the lifter of our head and however we come to jesus christ has a way of lifting us from where we are to where we ought to be that is not just something that ought to be preached about but it ought to be something that's lived out when that choir was singing i was lifted as they sang unto the lord cold and 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 hands almost frostbitten but they're here to serve and their ministry is not entertaining us it is lifting us it's inspiring us clap your hands somebody that's why we're here today that's why there's such a big deal about still keeping some degree of chapel going on even though that's my 12 o'clock signal to sit down even though even though we're not in the chapel, it was, it was important to have a chapel experience. There's so much in life that can knock us down. Racism can knock us down, and classism can knock us down, and gender bias can knock us down, and, 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 and those that think they are up here can try to knock down those that are down here. We are called in the name of Jesus Whatever our life, whatever our calling is, we're called to lift people from where they are to where they ought to be. And then number three, we are called not only to love and to lift, but we're also called to liberate people in the name of Jesus. We're called to set the captives free and to liberate the, liberate the lost by the power of God divine. 
and to rebuke the devil and to liberate people from the shackles that hold them down. In our church, Dean, as you know, there's a, there's a window of the black Christ that we, uh, that I created that window almost 30 years ago with the help of Dr. Dean Fulier and also Dr. King Hope Pelvin. They helped me design this larger than life stained glass window that is in the back of the sanctuary above the baptistry. And if you, it's a beautiful window. And if you look at the window, you'll see that at, at the, the knees of Jesus, there are chains that are broken, which is, and then not far, you see the scars in the hands of the risen Savior. That Jesus Christ can break every chain. He broke every chain then when he rose from the dead and he's breaking chains right now. Is there anybody in the building that knows that Jesus is still breaking chains? Breaking chains of depression, breaking chains of oppression, breaking chains of inferiority, breaking chains of discrimination. Jesus is still breaking chains. He came to set the captives free. And we still believe that Christ is still the answer. He came to change lives. He came to open up blinded eyes, and he's still doing it. He's still making a way out of no way, and this service, this Savior that we serve still reigns. And Jesus still has the nerve to interfere in the lives of fallen humanity. We serve a Savior that loves us enough to get up in our business, to wake us up in the middle of the night and tell us that relationship baby is not for you. You were not born to be smacked around. You need to get out of that. I know you've fallen hard and you're in love, and all, but baby, get out of that now. We're not just asking you to pray about it. We're telling you to be about it and get out of that abusive situation. I, Jesus wants to set us free. And I don't just mean in church ways, but in every area of our lives. He wants to deliver us and he wants to bring us absolute liberation. There is freedom in the house of the Lord. There is salvation in the house of the Lord. There is lifting and loving and liberation in the house of the Lord. Jesus Christ of Nazareth calls us not only to have opened eyes, but God's Christ calls us to open our eyes and then dare look around us and see our brothers and our sisters. To see others' pain and to see others' suffering and to see others that are in need of the touch of Christ. Christ has not only come just to save you and just to save me, but he's come that we might help and bring light and life to the brother and the sister on the job, to the family member, my friends around the corner, those that are sitting next to you even in this service right now. You don't know what people have gone through. You don't know what people have gone through just to get to this service today. You don't know what's waiting for them in the dorm. You don't know what's going on in their homes. You don't know what's going on back home. You don't know the burdens that they're carrying. You don't know whether or not they're able to make tuition or not. You don't know what so many people, that's why we've got to handle people carefully. We don't know what people are going through. Very quickly, I'm reminded, years ago, someone said to me, oh, Bishop, I came to church and, um, at a different church, and it was a Women's Day program, and everybody goes all the women were in purple. You know, that was back in the day. Yeah. And everybody wearing purple. And so this woman barely made it to church. She said, girl, told one of the friends, she said, I'm just going to sit in the back. And it, listen, it was all I could do to get into church today. Baby, I'm just going to sit down. And, and somebody from the committee came up here and said, why are you sitting back here? And where's your purple? How come you ain't got purple on? And the woman said, that, and she almost cussed her right on out in the church. She said, if you knew all the hell I went through, where I had to park, what I had to go through with my husband, my children, what I had to go through just to get into the church, then you wouldn't be bothering me about some purple. I'm just trying to say that's just one small example. You don't know what folk are dealing with. You don't know how close people are to the edge. Did not the prophet say, don't push me? Because I'm close to the edge. I'm just about to lose my head. It's like a jungle out here. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going under. <laughs> oh, that was a prophetic word. Because it is like a jungle out here. But we serve a God who can handle the jungle. And we serve a God who can carry us through the tortured places of our lives. 
the tortured places of our past, the tortured places in our minds. Jesus has come to deliver and to bring hope. He came to preach the gospel to the poor and to set the captives free. And we need this Savior. We need this Savior today. We need this Savior for the broken, the disillusioned, the discouraged, the hungry, the homeless, the unemployed, the prisoners, those victimized by injustice, abducted and missing, and nobody is looking for them like they did this other woman. We, we, he came that we might be concerned. Just this week alone, violence continues to abound, lives lost in Texas. Armad Armory's trial began with an all-white jury. Defense opening arguments are trying to portray him as a thief who, is, has, has, who, who his murderers had a right to shoot. In Minneapolis, they did not vote to reform the police department in spite of George Floyd murder. Republican verdict voter turned out was very, very high and apparent rebuke to President Biden's policies that are aimed at least at trying to increase equity. We've got some things to handle and we know a savior that can give us the grace. And I know some of you are tired of fighting, tired of serving, tired of protesting, but we've got to keep on keeping on in the name of Jesus and the God of heaven will give us the grace that we need to build a whole new world. Martin Luther King talked about the beloved community. Y'all remember Disney's play movie, Little Mermaid, and that song, A Brand New World. I have three daughters, you know, so you know we might we watch that movie over and over and over. I know it like that. But a brand God has caused us to have a brand new world. So in closing, I want to encourage you to keep on keeping. I want to encourage you, don't lose faith. The storm is passing over. Encourage my soul and let us journey on. Though the night is dark and I am far from home, thanks be to God. The morning light appears. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Let us leave this place in the glory of the Lord. Let us leave this place in courage, tapping our hands, tapping our feet, lifting our eyes under the hills from which cometh our help. Our help comes from the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of grace, the Spirit of help, God is with you, and God will help you, and God will give you abundance, and God will give you assurance, and God will love you, and God will lift you, and God will liberate you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. His message is our mission. Everybody is somebody. His message is our mission. There's deliverance in the house. His message is our mission. The hungry can be fed and the naked can be clothed. His message is our mission. He's still bread for the hungry, water for the thirsty. You know how we do. He's still able to make a way out of no way. Yes! Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge God. And God will direct your path. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not him. None else can heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. Jesus knows all about us.